This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 892, recorded on Wednesday, September 14th, 2022. It's time for Science Potty Talk. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we are going to fill your heads with vomit, poo, and general relativity. But first... Thanks to our amazing Patreon sponsors for their generous support of Twists. You can become a part of the Patreon community at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Birds do it. Bees do it. Educated folks with PhDs do it. Anthropologists, microbiologists, and animal vets do it. In Hollywood, the celebrity set do it. Beetles who navigate by the stars do it. Billionaires and last nickel drunks in bars do it. The Danes and Comenhound do it. Any city, any town, they do it. Old sailors who tell tales do it. <laughs> Tardigrades and killer whales do it. Polar bears and kangaroos do it. At some point, even me and you do it. Everybody, everywhere, poops. And well, most don't give two thoughts about what happens next. It's just sort of thing that we might fill your head with here on This Week in Science, coming up next. Big kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening. What's happening? What's happening? This week in science to you kiki and oh there's no blair today <gasps> no blair today hopefully she will return again next week we will miss her animal filled fun presence but in the meantime we have our guest for the show today Bryn nelson who is joining us to talk about his book that is out flush Ooh, put it right here and anyway hello everybody welcome to this episode of twists Thank you so much for joining us. Woo All right. We are here. We're here to talk about science. We do that, right? Every week we talk about science. And this week we have a very special show ahead. We're just going to push it right through. Okay. <laughs> I brought stories all about no you know i did actually did not bring any poop stories uh how to make a cell we're working on artificial cells everybody can we do it general relativity confirmed again that's pretty much the story but i might give you a few more details and there's some historical vomit out there along with virtual reality replacing psychedelics justin oh. what did you bring ah that can't happen that last one there uh what do I got? Oh, one that's very prescient to me right now. How to get a crying baby to go to sleep. Uh, a, a scientific, not an anecdotal there. They <laughs> did some experiments on babies to get them to sleep and found the best way. Uh, extremely adaptive fungi story. And, uh, the, ooh, and Justin's Animal Corner. Oh, I must have known Blair wasn't going to be here. Oh, I brought a I brought an animal story too. So yeah, yeah. we kind of planned ahead just a little yeah. bit. And Bryn, what have you brought for our show? <laughs> well, I have a book we can talk about. <laughs> you're you're in luck. Fantastic. I am looking forward to getting to your interview in just a little bit. But we're excited also that you are going to join us for commentary on some of these stories that we start the show with. As we get jumping into everything, everyone, remember that you can subscribe to Twists, all places that podcasts are found. Look for This Week in Science. We are also on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch, streaming live every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Pacific time-ish, right about there. And you can find us on the Twitters and the Instagram. We are at Twist Science. If all this is a bunch of stuff that you don't really want to deal with remembering just remember our website twist.org oh and give us a like and whatever there is wherever you're watching us or listening to us right now that would be a great help okay let's start with artificial cells i have to start with this one because to me this 
this is scientists working at Frankenstein stuff at a cellular level. It's very interesting work. Researchers trying to develop synthetic cells that bridge the gap between not life and life. And in this particular example, which was published uh, this week in Nature, researchers at the University of Bristol are using viscous micro droplets. So little tiny droplets of goo that are sticky, viscous ish. And then they are engulfing bacteria with their goo. And they're also, it's like, I, I guess, putting glitter on the outside of a, a Christmas ornament, like those Christmas balls getting glitter mm -hmm. on the outside. They're putting bacteria all over the outside of those viscous droplets. And then they basically kill the bacteria, break them up into their components, and then see if the components keep working. And lo and behold, according to their experiments, yes, they do. So all the components of the bacteria get working together on the outside and the inside of these synthetic protocells. They start making architecture for the, the microskeletons that are inside of the cells. They start working together to create little organelles and little bits and pieces and creating a lot of the proteins and enzymes that need to be there to start developing bacterial cell culture inside a cell, make a, make a metabolism work. Hmm. Um, they didn't stop there, though. They worked. It was very successful. And at, at that point, what they did is inserted E. coli into these bacterial innard goo balls. And E. coli acted as a um, an engine producing the ATP that's necessary to power them. It didn't go exactly as as planned. They did, it didn't continue looking just like a, a nice, how you kind of imagine roundish cell. These cells, once the E. coli came to, into play, began looking amoeboid in nature, and they started having little projections and started acting in a, a different manner. But what they did show is that they were able to bring little bits and pieces of bacteria to life in a different way. And so the idea moving forward is that they can fine tune the components that are involved, that they can synthetically create this, these protocells to address particular needs, uh, cleaning up environmental problems, addressing different, uh, different problems that we may have. Yeah, so that's the going. That's, that's a further leap there, but uh, uh, so it almost sounds though that they've created a a biofilm that they then damaged and are showing the disparate affects of these the bacteria that they used attempts to repair and had to add in something else for, for the ADP. Uh, I don't. I don't know if I'm really feeling synthetic life so much there but i but it is surprising that they did begin to build architecture in that repair response to try to keep everything going even if they're disparate uh bacteria which does tell you that life when stressed can survive but the the tough part there is in in any application that they think of most bacteria, the, the hard part is maybe not life itself, but is in uh, billions of years of getting to a niche where you can function out in an environment and do something <laughs> in your surroundings without getting eaten or uh, exposed to uh, something that's toxic. Right. To we're, we're trying to just sidestep that evolutionary process. Yeah, yeah. Because there's billions make, of years of make, work that go into fine tuning. Make life for a particular function. No fine tuning. Just. But there is there is that that uh, Jeff Goldblum uh, 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 life finds a way line that's just jumping out of this because here's here's this life that's being intentionally obliterated in this capsule and and still going I'll find a way I will find a way to keep this going that's really that's really intense but maybe not in a way that we. Uh 
would ever anticipate, right? I guess that's no. yeah. <laughs> that's the twist, right? Is 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 what else might it do? Yeah, and and that is the question. I guess you know we start with okay, we broke up the bacteria into all the pieces. What pieces do we need? What pieces can we get rid of? What happens when we take pieces of different bacteria and put them together? And so now it there is a bit and, and like I mentioned, a Frankensteinian aspect to this because you're taking a little bit of this and a little bit of that and putting it together and going, live, do something for me, right? Also, that, that technology they're using, doing that that micro drop, droplet, is it creates its own biome environment and everything else. Uh, I know it's been used quite a bit in artificial evolution, lots of stuff, because your your lab then isn't one dot that everybody's focused on. You can have thousands of these dots running experiments all at the same time. You know, so it's the throughput of doing things at this scale too is really, uh, really incredible. So you can run many, 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 many more experiments than just, you know, uh, one lab experiment, one off, and you see that result, and then you, all right, let's uh, let's start all over again, do it again. You, you can uh, the throughput on these types of experiments is is also really exciting. It is. Bryn, like did you want to say something? No, I, I, all I can say is it's way more uh, complicated than the E. coli research I was doing in grad school. I mean, I was yeah. I was obliterating like one protein <laughs> in the membrane to see what it did. And so, I mean, the expansion here is, is, is kind of mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, what we're doing now, it, sometimes, I mean, we are living in the future, right? There's a lot of science now that I look at and I say, wow, it's amazing that we have gotten to the point that we're at right now with what we're what we're capable of we're solving more problems than ever before answering more questions um, it's really exciting uh, but some people might want to take a look at this stuff and go what you doing there <laughs> what are we going to do with that it, it, yeah. it yeah it, it, it certainly does raise some you know ethical issues and i think that was the same you know it was the same thing where they had with recombinant dna right is that yeah. there was a kind of an ethical framework like let's kind of wrap our heads around that so i you know i hope that that's also uh, front and center moving forward with this yeah, yeah. maybe maybe <laughs> but the the thing that uh, always occurs to me in these like oh gosh the large hadron collider oh they're gonna bombard particles at these uh, intense energies and what happens if we create a black hole in the middle of it the thing is this is happening in space constantly these are these are interactions that take, you, what they've created here you have to imagine on some level is taking place constantly throughout nature yeah. it's yeah. just because we isolated this incident that we're able to observe it but there's nothing that seems like that couldn't be taking place uh, all the time uh, with, in, in the micro world. So I, I'm less afraid. I'm less afraid of, uh, of the Frankenstein monster uh, leaving the castle and going to town. No, I mean, it's just the, 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 the concept of taking all the disparate pieces and putting them together in, in new ways. But they're already there. They're already out there doing it. They're, they're out there. They're all out there. I know. Oh, then they're no. doing their thing and they've all evolved. Yeah. Then they're evolving still. I'm crying now. Can you tell me how to put oh, it? Oh, okay, yeah. So if you're crying, so here's what happens. <laughs> Here we are. You're mid-thought. Maybe you're thinking about, oh, what have I got? To, what chores do I have ahead? What's going on next week? I need to send that letter or invite that person. Maybe it's an important thought. Maybe it's not. It doesn't matter because it's gone. You, it, you, It's like you never had it. Zap. Thought is history. Your brain has been short-circuited. By an urgent rush of adrenaline, and your mind is now blank, ready to react to any form of danger in a split second. What caused this? Is the house on fire? No. Did you accidentally stick a fork in an electric eel? Not likely. Did a hungry lion leap out from behind the couch? Still not very likely. Uh, it's much worse than any of those scenarios. In fact, your baby is crying. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have experienced this. Yes. Yeah, yeah baby <laughs> cries are intended to get our attention and put us on high alert. If it's somebody else's baby, it's just an annoyance. But if it's your child, your brain immediately focuses on that uh, babe emergency 
And and often babies do cry before falling asleep. It's partly a way to, for them to process uh, the day and get rid of some excess energy, uh, but also because babies might just not like the way it feels to go to sleep. It's kind of a weird thing if you don't have a whole lot of perspective on it, I guess. So there's nothing worse than a baby who's crying uh, and tired and can't seem to fall asleep. Especially since also new humans tend to sleep a lot and several times a day, getting yeah. lots of, uh, of naps throughout the day. So, and getting to sleep is then just as important as staying asleep, because if you get a baby crying baby to sleep and you set them down and then 10 minutes later they're, they're crying again, you have to start over, which is also sort of soul wrenching. Yeah. <laughs> sucking yes uh, yeah so it's an important <laughs> part of baby's health because they need all of this sleep and it's also an important part of parental mental health to be able to uh to have those moments of peace while the baby's sleeping so science is coming to the rescue here to find out what is the best way to put a baby to sleep according to this uh paper published in current biology holding and walking them for five minutes followed by five to eight minutes of sitting with them after they fall asleep. Now, I can tell you from very current experience, uh, walking around with a baby for five minutes is a good introduction to this tale. It's, it's, it's not, that's not a, uh, necessarily the formula for success uh, in and of itself. But uh, it published in Current Biology. So this is, this is, one of the authors, Kumi Kuroda, from the Riken Center for Brain Science in Japan. Uh, Many parents suffer from babies' nighttime crying. Big issue, especially for inexperienced parents that can lead to parental stress. And, oh gosh, even uh, uh, infant maltreatment in a small number of cases where parents have apparently just lost it. So they, the lab had been already studying what they call a transport response. And this is a reaction seen in many mammals whose young are not able to care for themselves. Uh, so we're talking mice, dogs, monkeys, and of course humans. They observe that when these animals pick up their infants and start walking, the bodies of the young become docile, their heart rate slow. So the team wanted to compare the effects of this response uh, in humans with baby infants. They compared 21 infants' responses while under four conditions. One was being held by their walking mothers, held by their sitting mothers, lying in a still crib, or lying in a rocking cot. What they uh, found is when the mother walked, carrying the baby, the crying infants calmed down and their heart rate slowed within 30 seconds. Similar calming effect occurred when the infants were placed in the rocking cot, Uh, but not when the mother held the baby while sitting or placed the baby in a still crib. Suggesting that just holding your baby is insufficient, which kind of goes against some people have thought that it is the mother's touch. And it's it's a nice comforting thought. I think the mother's embrace is what calms the baby. But according to this, nope, it's uh, it's the motion. Even if that motion is a robotic (laughs) self self rocking crib, that motion is is really what's what's doing it. Uh, They said the. uh, Yeah. All crying babies in the study stopped crying. It doesn't say how long it took. That's important. (laughs) Also, they didn't have... What's your end point? Yeah. (laughs) They also didn't have my baby as part of this experiment. Because this is actually uh, what we have found works ahead of finding this study. This is is, is walking around is definitely the most effective thing that we found. Which is also interesting because... uh, Side note, they, they tried to give us advice in this maternity post-birth uh, training thing that we went to on how to be a parent, uh, that you should train the baby to fall asleep without motion. But according to this, there's a biological need for it. And so I don't feel so bad that we've ruined our child's sleep by <laughs> constantly using the motion uh, thing to help them sleep. But uh, also in this, they found that more than one third of the participants, uh, the babies, became alert again within 20 seconds 
of being put down. Oh. So they got them to fall asleep walking. They set them down. Where they were back up again. So that's when they found that the additional, after they've fallen asleep, sitting and holding then for another five to eight minutes allows them to get into a deeper sleep. And then the transition down into the, the crib was much easier. So that transition, you have to ease them into it. Yeah. Or as many as parents do, you end up putting the child in the stroller, walking around the block a few times, or sticking them in the car, driving around. There are many solutions. But I don't know, Justin, I think you should uh, use your N of one to test this. Type well, of <laughs> technically, I've got an N of I've got an N of uh, four now. So, so right. the thing is, but I don't think you're going to be um, still with, <laughs> walk, wait, wait, holding wait. and walking around with your 18 year old, right? 19. But yeah, he's uh, so. <laughs> but the but the thing that's interesting is the other three. The car was a, the was that one solution that you could go. Okay, nothing's working, and then when the parents start talking through their teeth, you know, it's time to go to the drastic measure. Nothing's working. Put them in the car. We'll drive around the block, burning gas until they fall asleep. This one doesn't like the car. <laughs> That's he, great. He, it's, Don't burn it's, the gas. That's it good. He, he, he was, he's even louder in the car. Even more adamant that he's not going to fall asleep. So, <laughs> so it and then it points out here at the end that you know, hey, we need this. This is a uh, something that we found, which is a. Temporary solution, or a, a uh, not not the not necessarily a long term solution. This is something that we found that works in an immediate soothing of a crying baby. But more study needs to be done, and it points out that babies are more complex than we thought. And I don't know who the we is there, other than people who didn't have kids. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's fair enough. There's a there's a lot of those people. Okay. Yeah. Schnago in our Discord is saying, when I was a kid, the answer was a crib full of puppies. At least that's what I've been told. My parents ran a kennel. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I think we need to test this hypothesis as yeah, well. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. Crib of puppies for all kids. This is something that needs to happen. Who, would, who wouldn't love that? Yeah. I, I, I would love that now. May I have exactly. my crib <laughs> full of puppies? <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, so the, the take-home message is we hold the baby and walk for five to eight minutes, sit down holding the baby for five to eight minutes, and then you put them down for sleeping, and hopefully they will stay. That's what the study says, five minutes and then five to eight. But yeah. uh, what, what, uh, what, what I, my discovery is you walk with them until they fall asleep, be that five minutes or half an hour. <laughs> yeah. The, the point, <laughs> though, is that... that that motion does the initial soothing and the lowering of the heart rate that then makes the transition to sleep easier uh, as opposed to, you know, just laying them in uh, the crib or just trying to sit and hold them. Got to get up and walk them around. Or one of those, like it's, I laughed at it. And I admit, I'm totally guilty. I laughed at it. They have, well, you go and you're shopping for baby stuff now. They have all these baby robot, like self, you know, self-rocking cribs or these yeah. little ones. Uh, like hammocks that go up and down well, the, automatically. Again, technology can be the technology. I was like, oh, what kind of lazy parent would want one of those things? And uh, having a robot <laughs> raise. Now I realize that's that's good. That's that's helping people. Um, let's see, helping people. Uh, this I don't know if this is really helping people. It probably help a lot of physics students and uh, and physicists who are trying to understand the universe. Researchers have yet, yet again tested the principle of general relativity to see whether an object's mass really determines how gravity affects it. So a uh, European sat satellite microscope has once again determined with unprecedented precision. We're talking 10 to the minus 15 power. So there's a lot of zeros after that decimal point for the accuracy of the effect of gravity on the mass of matter. Researchers had little capsules suspended in this microscope satellite, and they used 
static electricity to keep them suspended. So in the microgravity around in Earth's orbit of this satellite, there's a constant falling, right? Anything in orbit is constantly falling towards the Earth, except it's in this perpetual state of just kind of just missing and constantly. And so you, you have the orbit around the planet. So this has gravity acting on the mass within these capsules. And the question is, is the, the static electricity required to maintain different capsules' positions that are containing the exact same mass of different types of matter, is it the same amount of electricity that's required? And their experiment to the 10 to the minus 15th, they have confirmed yet again that yes, indeed, if you have a bowling ball or a feather, drop them both in a vacuum at the same time, they're both going to land at the same time. Going to happen. As long as they have the same mass. So that's the that's the quick and easy of it. And I just wanted to jump from there into uh, fossilized vomit because I think that then can lead us pretty nicely <laughs> into our conversation with Bryn. Um, so fossilized vomit has been discovered in Utah. There is a study in the journal Palaios and... Uh, in this particular find, they discovered yeah, vomit. It's called a boloid, and this fossilized vomit from some kind of creature, they had to figure out what it was from. It's 150 million years old, and the fossil site has a lot of plant remains around. They have identified it previously as a pond. So this was an area where there were amphibians and where there were fish. And they don't think this was dinosaur vomit. They think it was fish vomit. Because within a pond, you would find predatory chains that would potentially involve what was vomited up being eaten, a frog and a salamander. And they're no longer existent, uh, but these particular species of salamander and frog um, they haven't I completely identified them from the, the bone remains that were left in the vomit. But they think that a bowfin fish vomited up its meal to get away from another predator that was probably chasing it. That's their, that's their hypothesis. Now, this could be what happened. Could also be that a frog or a salamander would have had toxins. Mm -hmm. on their skins that could have led to the vomiting. So uh, we don't know what exactly led to it, but these researchers believe that there was a predatory chain and this fossilized vomit has led them to understand the ecosystem of this ancient pond a little bit better. Very cool. Hmm. Wow. So it, something didn't agree with that fish. <laughs> yeah, so it's the question of is it something didn't agree with the fish, whether it's the predator trying to eat it, and it was it was this a a tactic to not be eaten? You know, I'm gonna throw up my lunch on you, don't eat me. Or I'm gonna throw up my lunch, eat that instead. <laughs> don't eat me. Or, or I need to swim a little faster and this is yeah. weighing me down. <laughs> it's weighing me down. Yeah. I know. Fascinating. There there are many questions we have about these things that our bodies get rid of and uh yeah these things our bodies get rid of they're disgusting ew why do we want to talk about them we're going to talk about them in just a minute this is this week in science if you are enjoying the show please tell a friend today hey everyone this is this week in science and right now we're going to come back with our special guest Bryn Nelson, who has written a book called Flush. Now, Bryn has a PhD in microbiology, is a Seattle-based freelance writer and editor with an avid interest in biology, biomedicine, ecology, green technology, and unconventional travel destinations. You may have seen his byline in publications like Newsday, New York Times, or Scientific American. Uh, and now, on the cover of his book, Flush. The Remarkable Science of an Unlikely Treasure. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. As pleasurable as... 
okay. I know where you, I know where you're going. <laughs> I yeah, maybe I won't finish that one. So, how did you end up writing a book about a topic that people generally try not to talk about in polite company? Um, well, I, as a microbiologist, I uh, already have an affinity with microbes. So, um, you know, I've just been fascinated uh, with uh, bacteria, and you know, the microbiome is just so incredibly interesting to me. And the the fact that we actually still know very little about what a lot of the microbes in our gut is what they're actually doing. You know, we when I had my microbiome sequenced, um, <clears throat> a lot of the, the species, they would say, you know, uh, isolated from the gut of a healthy person. And that was it. You know, so what yeah. What, yeah, so there's there's so much that we don't know. And and uh, I did a, a feature story for a magazine called Mosaic um, a number of years back, and um, it was about uh, fecal transplants. And basically, this is a, a therapy that was laughed at. You know, doctors and people thought it was disgusting, um, and no one believed that this would actually work. And it works. Uh, what happened was a lot of desperate people would have to take matters into their own hands, literally, um, and and do these uh, DIY fecal transplants, and they would cure each other with them. And so yeah. science started to take notice, and then they started to do the experiments that they need to do, you know, the double-blind placebo-controlled experiments, and we're able to show that this is not only effective, but it's more effective than a lot of the antibiotics of last resort, like vancomycin. And in fact, uh, some of the studies were so effective that they stopped it early and gave people the fecal transplants because they thought it was unethical for them to actually continue with the, the, you know, the control, which was the antibiotic. And so I was just fascinated by the evolution of this therapy from something that is this kind of uh, gross folk remedy to something that's solidly in uh, mainstream medicine. And um, and I think, you know, ever since then, I've just been obsessed, I guess, or fascinated with the idea of, you know, this thing inside of us that we produce that's that's natural, right? It's a natural product yeah. and that it has real value. And it's something that we have not talked about and we've ignored. And what that means for some people is it, it literally can be deadly. Yeah. So did you get an understanding about uh, the disgust that we feel for it? You know, the ignoring issues. People don't talk about things that affect their gut. People don't talk about things that are affecting things coming out the other end. Right. Um, and that can lead, lead to really grave illness. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I have a whole chapter in the book on the psychology of disgust. Yeah. And, um, and and that was something that I started exploring as part of the feature. And I decided that it had to be its own chapter because it was just so, uh, it was so interesting to me. But there is a, there is an evolutionary reason for this. You know, we have uh, pathogen disgust, there's sexual disgust, there's moral disgust. Um, these are kind of the three categories that people have kind of lumped uh, different types of disgust into. But the reason is uh, things that are slimy, icky, um, you know, cockroaches, rats, uh, vomit, <laughs> poop. Um, these are all things that can potentially make you sick. So there is a valid reason for uh, us to have this emotional response. And disgust is a really strong emotion. In fact, a lot of researchers think it's the most uh, potent emotion that we have, um, even more so than fear. Uh, but the problem is uh, it can also work against our own best interests. And so I think hopefully by kind of uh, uh, talking to people about, okay, here's, here's how disgust works, uh, we might be able to, to maybe undo some of the damage of extreme disgust, you know, because it can be used against people. You know, it has been throughout history. Um, and that's kind of the unfortunate dark side, you know, of disgust. And so, right. you know, yeah. yeah. It's also interesting, though, because uh, having grown up and lived on a few farms, uh, you know, sometimes that's gold. It, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so so <clears throat> it, it is. I wonder if some of it is, too, like, because of sanitation, 
we've also been uh, so far. That's like great. my first impression was it went down a hole, or went you know water goes down a hole and it's magically is gone. Uh, yeah. It just goes away. You never have to think about it or see it again there. And so we're not used to it even being in our environment in any way. Right. Uh, right. Until then, you're a parent and you become. You know, <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. It becomes something that you rate <laughs> on a buy di- diaper basis of yeah. about the quality of diet. Yes. You know, you start thinking as a nutritionist, oh, this is a oh, this is a good one. Oh, what's wrong with this one? That doesn't like you know, it it changes perspective again. Uh yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like every day, uh, you know, I, we have a dog. I mean, and, and even with a dog, you know, it's like, okay, did she poop? What did it look like? Oh, it was gross. What did you feed her? You know, so there there are these discussions that we have. What? There, and... Oh, there's my shoe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> for that. Exactly. Or, you know, like the whatever, yeah, whatever she chewed up last night. Um, but... But also, I think what's what's interesting about parents and and, and Justin, this, you may relate to this, is that you know when you are a new parent, you may have visceral strong disgust toward your uh, infant's diapers, but you have to acclimate because that's part of you know taking care of a child. And there was actually a really fascinating study where. <laughs> It was it was kind of hilarious because they basically had uh, women smell diapers, and some of the diapers were from their baby, and some were from other babies, and the diaper from their baby smelled less disgusting than those from other babies. Wow. And they did oh. it; they repeated it uh, multiple times, and then to just to make sure that this wasn't an artifact, they would mislabel. Uh, so and they still found that they still found the same uh, response. And what one of the one of the details was uh, <laughs> the poor unfortunate uh, person who was charged with setting this up was apparently like so disgusted that as part of the research paper basically described sort of dry retching, you know, <laughs> as part as part of this, and you know, and kind of like oh, sci- scientific of language, yeah, all in the name of science, right? But it shows, I mean, I think what's fascinating about it is that as parents, um, you have to, you know, you have to learn to live with it, right? And what it suggests is that there is a desensitization to disgust that can help us with with other things as well. And in fact, um, you know, psychologists will sometimes use that for people who have um, obsessive compulsive disorder, for example. There's a whole desensitization process that's very similar. Yeah. Blair uh, is actually with us in the chat room. She's saying, is is that uh, an acclimation or because of a shared microbiome? Uh, seemingly that the parent is not uh, as disgusted. Right. What there. leads to the, the let the, I, I the don't let think, your disgust? I mean, <laughs> eventually it could be a microbiome, right? But at first, there shouldn't be much of a shared microbiome. Well, it, 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 you you generally share a portion of your microbiome with other people in your household, but it can be quite variable. And in fact, it can be quite variable within your own gut from day to day. So, you know, there may be uh, uh, some sort of, uh, I guess, a, sh- a shared function. But I think with the level of disgust, which is such a powerful emotion, I don't know. It's an interesting question. I, I, I think that it's more of a sensitization of that. And, but, but actually, if you, if you think about it, there might be uh, some connection because one of the things that we give off uh, as humans are these volatile organic compounds, VOCs, right? right? And poop actually uh, is a huge contributor. You know, so uh, your saliva, uh, your sweat, uh, other bodily fluids and poop. And uh, so far, scientists have found more than uh, 2,700 different compounds that we give off. So we basically have this sort of invisible cloud around us. So part of it may be... <laughs> All of us are pig pen. Yeah, well, yeah right. This, this is sort of this, this cloud. Um, and, it's, and it's actually how dogs 
can tell one individual from another because they have such a keen sense of smell. They can actually distinguish one person from another on the basis of the compounds that we're emitting from our poop. So if you think about it from a mother's standpoint, if you're familiar with that scent, I guess, mm -hmm. for, for lack of a better phrase, that may actually contribute to a familiarity and then a desensitization over time. So that might yeah. be one way in which, you know, maybe it's a shared microbiome or maybe it's just familiarity with right. the compounds released from that microbiome. But then and there's as also we just know, the baby's, the baby's feces changes the poop. It starts out, as you describe it, it starts out as the meconia, the, the dark black yep. tar like substance, and then it changes and it's like a yellowy kind of like mustard kind of color. And then it's later that the solid poops. When the solid food comes, that's when the solid poops. And the, the yellowy poops, they're, they don't smell that bad. It's not really that terrible. It's the, it's later <laughs> that the smell comes. Yeah. And so the other thing on there with what is in the poop, what's happening? The other part, though, is to, to just to be fair, though, is it's in the creek. It, none of that matters. If if a if a bird pooped on my car, I I don't care. I'm not gonna rush out and and barehandedly scrape it off of my car. I don't care about my car that much. Right. I don't feel that instinctual level of. Caring for but. protecting my car, but if the bird pooped on my kid, I would immediately oh wipe it off, and if I don't, you know, use my own shirt to clean them up, and you know, spit and do one of these on it, like all of that, like without hesitation, because I'm uh, caretaking and protecting from the poop, even, you know. So it's not, that's not, not what I'm talking about. I'm talking me. about human poop and how it changes. How does human poop change from oh, yeah. birth to adulthood? What is it? it? <laughs> right. So, well, one of the things, and I, I, and actually, I can get back to 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 the emotion, and that changes over time because I think that's another fascinating issue. But to your to your point, Kiki, um, we know that uh, poop is about forty percent microbes, living or dead. You know, now that changes depending on where you are, but that's a huge amount. That's the dry uh, content. I mean, seventy five percent of poop is water, but if you just go by the twenty five percent or so, that's solid. Um, you know, forty percent is poop. That's a lot. Then you have uh, you have plant fibers. Um, that's a good portion of it. You know, you have nutrients. As you are going to um, start eating more solid food, that composition is going to change, right? And it also changes based on the level of plants in your diet versus meat. So one of one sort of fun fact is uh, most people in the U.S. have a fiber deficit. We don't eat nearly as much fiber as we should. People in other parts of the world naturally eat much more fiber. And as a result of that, uh, their poop often is about twice uh, the weight of ours. Because not only because of the fiber, but if you think about different types of fibers, actually food for the microbes, it encourages the growth of more microbes. So their proportion uh, in their poop of, of microbes plus the fiber is going to be larger, right? So it's a, so it's, it's, it's a fascinating um, idea of, of, you know, literally what you eat is going to determine what comes out the other end, right? right. Um, and yes. as we get to more, uh, you know, solid foods and, and uh, you know, your poop is going to change. I think for, for, for parents, one of the reassuring things is that uh, baby poop is notorious for the, you know, different colors, you know, it can be green, it can be yellow, you know, basically anything other than, you know, white or red is, is generally fine. You know, pediatricians are like, okay, you know, you have the meconium, that's almost like a black, you know, to begin with. But after that, you know, there, there are all kinds of different shades of brown and green and yellow, and most of those are perfectly fine. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, some of the other colors like white that can uh, uh, suggest some sort of obstruction, for example, you yeah. know, and obviously red, you know, can, can signify bleeding. Uh, but yes, so yeah, definite, definitely, definitely. Uh, what what we eat over over time as we age has a very immediate effect on our our poop. 
I'm picturing the public service announcement. You know how they're like, uh, oh, it's going to be a heat wave, so conserve electricity, don't have any unnecessary lights on. Or, oh, it's a water shortage, so don't water your lawn. Oh, hey, our, our waste management uh, treatment plant is uh, at capacity. We need everybody to go on a low-fiber diet <laughs> for the next week so we can recover. Exactly. So that's a, a great segue into uh, part of your adventures, or your poo ventures. You, uh, you, you've done travel writing, but you took travel writing in a different direction this time around. Yes, <laughs> yes inner, inner, inner travels, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I figured, you know, if I was going to write about it, and, you know, I'm not a doctor, obviously, so I can't, you know, dispense medical advice. But, you know, if I'm going to write about uh, uh, things that, that seem reasonable or unreasonable, I wanted to try them on myself first, you know, because, if, you know, the same thing about using uh, uh, recycled biosolids. Uh, I wanted to use them on my own garden, make sure that I was comfortable with that, right? So, so that was kind of my rule. For, for for researching and writing the book is that okay if I'm if I'm writing about something I should probably try it myself you know and see mm -hmm. see what it does um, and 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 basically the 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 kicker of of all of that was that um, it didn't necessarily matter what I took as far as supplements it was all about kind of what I ate as vegetables and uh, uh, yogurt right. So it's, it basically comes back to your parents' advice of, you know, eat your veggies. And in this case, it's actually not only just eat your veggies, but eat diverse kinds of vegetables, because what that's doing is providing different kinds of fiber for you, right? Which, which ends up being a really interesting thing. But the, the further thing is that that alone isn't necessarily enough. There have been some interesting studies that looked at, okay, what happens if we give people uh, uh, diets that are high in fermented foods versus diets that are high in fiber? And it turned out that the fermented foods are actually the most important. And so the idea is if you are just giving people fiber, but you're not giving them the microbes that can actually eat the fiber, that's not necessarily going to help you as much. Um, and in fact, you know, a lot of people who kind of go from zero to 60 on fiber, you know, will get very uncomfortable <laughs> and get sort of, you know, bloated and gassy. And that suggests that they don't have the, the, the microbes in their gut yet that can actually uh, uh, eat the fiber, can actually um, uh, uh, act upon it in the right way. Yeah. yeah, so you're going to want the yogurts and the or the kefirs and the kimchi and yeah. those sorts of foods along yeah. with your yeah, fiber supplement <laughs> or your vegetables. Absolutely. <laughs> I had a, a friend that's got the IBS, or, yeah. uh, right? And and every once in a while goes on a fermented oat drink diet for like a span of about a week or so and that kind of clears it up for a while yeah. and it and i didn't really it's interesting that uh, you were saying that because i didn't really understand why a fermented oat drink would help because it seems like like i would rather have ibs than drink that but. <laughs> there are the, the yeah the good i mean the good news is, is there's there's many more uh, fermented foods now right so you can pick things that you actually enjoy eating and that's the other thing right is because you know people we would tell people like oh you know you have to have fermented foods you have to have vegetables well there's there's a huge variety of them and you're not going to like them all. So, I mean, you know, pick something that you're actually going to stick to um, that you actually enjoy eating. Um, but but yeah, it's 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 basically, you know, uh, if you think of, of your gut, you know, it's a whole ecosystem. You know, you have predators, you have prey. I mean, it is in, incredibly complex and it's also very easy for it to become unbalanced. So you know, sometimes writing that is just a matter of, you know, stepping back and saying, okay, I'm going to eat some more veggies, you know, instead, or I'm going to make sure that I have yogurt every morning. Um, you know, and sometimes that's enough to kind of get that, get that back in sync. So you, uh, you had your microbiome tested, had the, had the, had your gut flora 
confirmed. What other things did you do uh, for this book? Um, so one of the fun things about that is um, I it was like I was cramming for a test, right? Because I was like determined that I wanted to have you know a high number of, of species in my gut, you know, for whatever reason. And so you know I was eating yogurt every day. I was taking this probiotic, you know, that had like ten different uh, species in it. Um, I was taking fiber pills uh, in the afternoon. You know, I was I was I was eating pretty healthy, I think. But the fun the funny thing is that uh, when I actually got the results back, none of the ten species in the probiotic uh, appeared in my gut. Mm. None of them took. That's so strange. Um, because well, and I think part of it is because some of them are transient uh, species. Mm-hmm. Like we as infants uh, have a lot more of the, the lactobacillus, you know, uh, bacteria. As we age, we have less and less of those. Uh, we can supply our gut with that on a temporary basis through yogurt, you know, but there's a question of, okay, have, should we have that and we've lost it? Or is that something that sort of normally happens as we get older? Because we <laughs> For have some because, people, they have the genes to create the lactase enzyme so that yep. they can continue to break it down. But other right. people like me, right, <laughs> we're not so lucky. Right, and I'm partially lactose intolerant as well. Mm. So, so, and and interestingly enough, uh, yogurt actually supplies that enzyme. So, if you're eating yeah. yogurt. For that period of time, you could then also theoretically drink milk and you would be okay mm-hmm. because the uh-huh. yogurt is supplying the enzyme the that you that you lack. Yeah. Through the through the bacteria. Exactly. Um, so it's a te- it's a it's a temp it's a temp it's a temporary thing. I'm going to eat the yogurt and eat, uh, and then have the pizza. Well, I would say, yeah, go, you might want to go easy. <laughs> Don't maybe not like a, a giant glass of milk. Um, but 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 what the, the other interesting thing was, um, several of the species uh, in the yogurt actually did appear um, in my gut, and um, so it suggests we we know more about uh, the microbes in yogurt because most of the testing has been done uh, with that. It's much easier to control, you know, in, in terms of the number of different uh, species and kind of the the amount, if you will. Uh, the problem is that a lot of uh, supplements right now on the market are unregulated. So you really have very little idea of what's in them. And, you know, they'll say, you know, X number of live cultures. But you're you're basically taking their word for it. So mm-hmm. it comes it comes down to, you know, is this a company that's trustworthy? And I'm not saying that that supplements are, are bad. You know, I think for some people they can work really well. They're just well. not regulated. I think you just have to be really careful, right, yeah. about which ones. And and even though they didn't appear uh, in the 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 sequencing, and that was one snapshot in time, right? Your 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 gut microbiome changes on a regular basis. So this was one particular moment in time that they didn't happen to appear. It doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't doing anything, because uh, to the point about uh, the the synthetic biology story. Um, even if the uh, microbes aren't, you know, alive, if they're kind of broken apart, their products may still uh, be doing different things in our gut, right? So, so just the fact that the living microbes um, didn't appear doesn't necessarily mean that there was no effect at all, which I think is a really interesting thing. Because if you think about it, what you really care about are the proteins, Right. And the, mm-hmm. the components of the bacteria, those are the engines. Those are what are doing things. And so they may still be doing something in your gut. It's just that there's not enough of the microbes themselves to kind of register as living. You know, so. Right. So anyway, right. so, actually living in there. Yeah. So. Um, but yeah, but that was that was an absolutely fascinating uh, journey, travel journey through my gut, <laughs> I guess. Um, but then I also I also uh, had um, apps. Uh, the the one uh, the one's Pcal, the other one's Plop. <laughs> the the third one that's not shown is Poo, is, is Poo Keeper. Um, they're they're kind of unintentionally hilarious because um, 
the the big cow is like a calendar you know it kind of mm-hmm. reminded me of a little advent calendar because i started in uh, december and uh, you have these little symbols right that appear that are supposed to be like the representative uh, uh poop of the day uh, <laughs> but it will give you messages like you're doing a good job you know <laughs> which is is kind of funny that you're getting a gold star for pooping um but we all we have to gamify everything these ex- days. Exactly. Yeah. So, so they're they're really useful as a if you if, if if your goal is basically just to be more observant, like you know what what are you eating and what's coming out, right? Doing this uh, basically helps establish a baseline, so you understand kind of what's normal for you, and that makes it easier than to observe if there's changes uh, you know over time that are are concerning you know some of the apps unfortunately will then try and say well maybe you have this i think that's much less useful uh because you know there's not a doctor involved here it's an app uh so you know that that particular aspect um i would be quite skeptical of but as basically an observational aid uh, something where you can just quickly say, okay, you know, this is the, 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 and there's the Bristol scale. I guess we should maybe talk about the Bristol scale. Um, but it's basically a scale of the consistency of your poop. And it's all the way from kind of the constipation, uh, side of things to diarrhea and, uh, the shapes, uh, different, uh, gastroenterology, uh, doctors will have, uh, uh, different shapes that <laughs> they can tell patients, but you know it's like clump of grapes, and you know the the sausage in the middle is sort of what you should should shoot for. Um, yeah, I think food maybe not, <laughs> maybe a little unfortunate that you're <laughs> using food references I, to right, talk gonna, about the shape of your yeah. poo. Well, I mean, it is maybe what's left of your food, right? And, yeah. Um, <laughs> But it, but it, but as a, but as a very uh, a quick uh, visual aid, it gives you a sense of uh, the transit time, because that's that's basically what you are uh, you're measuring, or it's a, it's a proxy for the transit time, and so things that are going very slowly um, are going to be more on the kind of the hardball clump of grapes side of things, suggesting that you might have constipation, whereas the porridge <laughs> side of things, you know, doesn't take a lot of imagination there. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but, for, but, but for some people, it's actually really, uh, it's really important because yeah. we know that there are all, all kinds of uh, intestinal disorders, uh, transit uh, related diseases. Um, and so, this can actually be a really important thing for doctors to know, you know, like, okay, what's, what, what's your experience been like over the last month or so. Right. Um, so anyway, so these, these are things I, I, I did, uh, I basically have been doing these for about a year and 10 months now, uh, because I just got in the habit of doing it. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to do, but I think it can actually be surprisingly informative for people. So similar to parents looking at their baby's diapers to check things, I mean, you've gotten into a daily habit of tracking your bowel movements. And so, I mean, did it, was it hard at first? Was, were you like, that's gross? Or, and, and now are you just like, oh, that's just, that's just what I do? Or, I mean, as a scientist, were you just ready to begin the experiment? I mean, I'm I'm not one of those sort of hardcore quantified self uh, people. You know, I did talk with a researcher and um, he and his uh, thesis advisor did this for a year, but they actually had like hundreds of values. So, I mean, it was way more intense than I did it. And at the end of the year, he just wanted to chuck his cell phone because he was so he was so sick of it. Um, Mm -hmm. But it was fascinating because they also then uh, sequenced their microbiome had different steps along the way, right? So they were able to track exactly what was happening. What happens when you travel? What happens when you eat certain things? What happens when you have a bacterial infection? Um, You know, it was only an N of two, uh, but it was a deep dive, right, into what was happening. Um, I'm not that hardcore. 
And, you know, I'm disgusted by certain things. It just, for whatever reason, this isn't one of them. So I would, I would love to get my own microbiome uh, sequence. Okay. Uh, I consider myself to be uh, an iron gut type uh, super performer because I can have the most ridiculously horribly varied diet. It can be a good diet, a bad diet, or this whole thing. Like Blair was joking in the uh, chat room that uh, she would eat a tire to get rid of her IBS, let alone fermented drinks. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, so I have uh, even offered uh, a, a Dr. Justin's not a real doctor poo pills, not guaranteed to be in poo form. <laughs> To the audience, for anybody who's got IBS, I'll send you a sample. <laughs> but but there is there is you know we had a guest on uh, Josiah Zayner who who self did one of these replacements. He took antibiotics, yeah, and then he had this really fit athletic friend yeah. uh, who he borrowed samples and pill formed them himself, yeah, and took them over a course of I think forty days. Uh, and did find like his IBS miraculously disappeared, and the, these rashes that he would get that he thought were totally unrelated stopped happening. Yeah, and uh, and then he's the, the funniest thing I thought though was uh, he he he's this is a guy who's a health food nut, you know, trying to get rid of that. He also lost like 10, 15 pounds. Like all these things happen at once. He's a guy who never touches sugar, never has a craving for it, eats all, healthy all the time. Went to the store, threw in a big thing of cookies, like I think a whole big cube of Oreo cookies into the thing, not knowing why. It's like, I don't know why I bought them. I got home, I threw them up on a shelf. It's not something I've ever, ever tasted or would care for. And then one night, put them down from the shelf, like ate the whole thing. <laughs> and then, and then was talking to his friend, uh, you know, I was like, hey, you know, uh, do you ever have sh uh, sugar cravings, anything like that? Do you ever like eat a whole bunch of cookies at once, trying to see if it was connected? And his friend's like, nah, I don't eat cookies. And I eat healthy and all that kind of stuff, blah, blah, blah. Oh, but every once in a while, yeah, I'll, I'll buy a pint of ice cream and eat the whole thing. And so it was such an interesting, there was like an unconscious driver of this new microbiome. That, oh, that, right. that made him pull down the cookies <laughs> that you would never have purchased. Right. Right. Take them home and just, yeah, you're going to need that later, buddy. Uh, like, sort of drove food urge uh, right. that wasn't even, like, uh, hungry while shopping. Wasn't even occurring in that moment. Right. All of which I found uh, very fascinating. Well, but how much did, and I, uh, I'm sorry, I haven't had a chance to read your book yet. Do you talk about the, 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 what, the replacement, the... Uh, Fecal transplants. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think what one of the one of the fascinating things is uh, there are a number of different stool banks um, around the country. Uh, the biggest one, uh, which is now transitioning a little bit, but Open Biome, you know, has been one of the biggest for a number of years. And they screen uh, donors, and they uh, are, have a very very uh, strict screening process. And only three percent of the people uh, pass. So, I mean, so that's a lower acceptance rate than Harvard. Uh, so you have donors who, who have already uh, passed, you know, a number of different stringent tests. But one of the reasons they do that is because as we're learning more about the microbiome, we don't want to get to the, to the, the unintentional harm that may come from uh, someone's microbiome uh, predisposing them towards diabetes, for example, mm -hmm. to your point, right? So that if you are then transplanting this into someone else, you are then making them, you know, more predisposed. You know, whether you transfer cravings or not, you know, I mean, you know, it's debatable. But there, but there certainly is uh, uh, evidence to suggest that there can be some long-term effects if you're not doing this properly. The other thing that's really fascinating about this is that as you go away from uh, uh, C. diff infection, so, so the, the, the primary uh, application for fecal transplants is, is uh, a Clostridioides uh, difficile infections, C. diff. So that's, that's a real tough one to knock out. It's a really tough one to knock out. Um, often it's hospital acquired, um, but not always. And if you have that infection, you tend to be susceptible to repeated infections. So because the, this is what the C. difficile, it does some sort of uh, self-protective, like 
There's a, uh, it, has a, it, has a it has a it has a spore. Yeah, or uh, yeah, a, a, a capsule. Uh, capsule. Uh, so so yes, so it can be very very difficult to uh, to clean from uh, from uh, hospital rooms. Um, and in the book, I talked with one patient who had had the infection eight times, um, and you know, and she was dying. And this was a patient who uh, basically recruited her husband to essentially save her life. Uh, this, the, the mechanism for that is more like you're uh, replanting someone's inner garden to crowd out the weeds, right? So it's, it's almost sort of like a, a mechanical function. If you are replacing someone's uh, completely imbalanced microbiome with a sort of a fully intact one, you may be able to kind of crowd out C. diff. But if you, as you move on to more complicated diseases, so colitis, Crohn's, for example, some of these autoimmune conditions, there is some evidence that uh, fecal transplants work but there also seems to be a donor effect. And what some of the research has shown is that some donors seem to have something that others don't. And so it really kind of depends on who the donor is. So it's not just you're crowding out, you're, it's, you're actually providing something. Uh, and, and that's been shown in a number of different studies. So that's a really active area of research because, of course, researchers want to know, well, what is that? And can we do it in a way, can we replicate this so that we don't have the poo pills, you know, or the... the, the... Wait, wait, you're cutting into my business now. Hang on. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. <laughs> but, but because I, I know that, and I'm fascinated to find this out because I, you know, it's sort of like allergies. Uh, I didn't have allergies forever and so what are allergies and I, I don't even under I had no compassion for, for the poor folks that had allergies and then I moved to a place where I had really bad allergy to something and, and I was like oh this is terrible now I get why people are taking pills and upset and can't go outside on certain days with the with my my gut I've I don't get an irritable I don't get an upset and I I eat either really healthy or really terrible I, there's doesn't there's not like a rhyme or reason to a consistent diet that I've had over years, but have never experienced any of these troubles. I'd be fascinated to find out if I've got some little subset of of microbiota in there that are fixers, <laughs> just sort of you know whatever the imbalance that's that that is taking place in others or whatever the the bad uh, actors are. Because I understand that in some IBS, there's actual they've isolated some bad actors mm -hmm. that are involved causing inflammation and that sort of thing. Maybe the, the, that, that good donor thing is, is, a, is a, a counter to the bad actors. Maybe it's something that actively uh, seeks and attacks them even. I don't know. It, it's it's right. so fascinating because we're just scratching the surface on this. Right. Yep, absolutely. And that, and that uh, one of the fascinating things is that people talk about keystone species. So you may have a, a bacterial species that recruits other species and then actively keeps out uh, others uh, because we know that uh, some bacteria can change the pH, for example, and make the, the, the colon more inhospitable to, to, to other microbes. And, you know, the, the, the different uh, proteins and other factors that they will uh, uh, secrete can uh, have effects for either recruiting uh, uh, microbes or, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, killing some of the other ones and even the 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 byproducts of their metabolism can then be food for other microbes right so that's you you, you kind of have this whole very complicated ecosystem that has evolved um, and that's what's so fascinating about it is because we haven't you know you we've, we've struggled to kind of distill that down you know because people are trying to do uh, uh, say, well, okay, if we have these two dozen bacterial species, or if we have these, you know, 50, uh, maybe we can sort of replicate what a fecal transplant is doing. And it's worked in some cases, but not quite as well as, as the full deal. This is the super donor will be. Uh, Jason Bombardier in the chat uh, wins with, can we call it colonizing? <laughs> <laughs> I, I like it. I like it's it. Yes. Fun of the night. Yes, we, yes, we can. Yes, we can. <laughs> Colonizing. <laughs>
no, but it's, it, it, I mean, it's, it's true. There's a whole, there's a whole line of research on um, kind of the sequence of microbes that will colonize a baby's gut, right? And we know that depending on, uh, you know, if, if uh, a baby is breastfed versus uh, a formula, that that can have a big impact on uh, the microbiota. You know, if you have a pet in the house, if you're on a farm, you know, mm-hmm. all of these, all of these things have really uh, uh, consequential uh, impacts, and mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, and just and that 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 the the stages of uh, of colonizing colonizing an infant <laughs> gut is is uh, interesting because I've uh, there was a study some time back that was talking about the virus load mm-hmm. uh, is highest in infants than it will ever be again. The diversity of, of viruses. Uh, load in, in uh, infants is higher than it by stops around age two, but is, is higher than it is in your adult life ever again. And part of the idea there is that those were uh, phages that were sort of working as dormant to the gut microbiota. So those those viruses in in the newborn are sort of a first stage immune system, and they're also sort of doing a selection process then. Yes for what gets to get established in the first place. Right. So then we're then we're even backtracking like, okay, well, okay, now hang on. <laughs> we got yeah. the ecosystem. There's a selector for the ecosystem right. that has, that's a viruses that are doing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. The, the, right, the vi- I mean, the viruses that are literally uh, predating on some of the microbes, right? And so, right. yeah, I mean, the, 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 I think the latest estimate is that um, you know, it used to be that uh, it was 10 to 1 that we were outnumbered. They've since um, updated that. So it's basically 1 to 1, which is the, the bacteria. But then if you include the viruses, then you have to, then you have another uh, uh, at least equal uh, number because for every bacteria, uh, there, there's likely to be a virus because you have the predators, you have the prey. Right. So then you have the bacteriophages. And, and we know that in the sort of the window of time, um, I think right to your point, within the first couple of years of life, there's a very strong kind of development of the immune system so that your body is learning what is friend, what is foe, right? And the microbes that you have and the viruses uh, play a really important role in your body sort of figuring that out. If you don't have that, uh, the evidence suggests that you're prone to uh, certain things later in life, uh, diabetes, obesity, um, asthma uh allergies so so yeah so so it really is suggesting that there is this really important window of time and a lot of it is what's happening in your gut and i'm, I'm curious too to know if there's a if those super performers that they're they, uh, that they're sequencing the gut microbiome are they if are they finding is, are they looking for are they able to find a viral uh component there that's that's uh because that would be interesting if there was still that predation taking place. There was a persistent virus that was that was helping. And that's a, I mean that's a fascinating question. And, and actually, uh, so Lena Zeldovich, who also wrote a book about poop, uh, is working on another book about bacterial phages. And that's you know that's such a, a fascinating thing. So right, so that's that's another level. So that would actually be a good question for her. Um, um, I don't I don't know to what extent people are looking at that, but I think that is uh, kind of a new avenue that people are looking at because they're realizing also that phages could be a, a good alternative to antibiotics, right? right? If you pick the right one, it can attack and kill your pathogenic uh, bacteria. But but yeah, that's an excellent question. I think I think they're just starting to look at uh, sequencing of the guts. I know that there was a really interesting study out of Canada, and that was looking. I think it was in colitis, but there was a very strong donor effect. Um, and then they did sequencing to show that the donor's uh, microbiome was quite different than the uh, the other donors. I don't think that they actually then looked at uh, the, the the viruses in his gut, but that would be a really fascinating thing to do as a. And it's know. it's a look and, at and the it, whole it, ecosystem yeah. for sure. Yeah, because this yeah. is one of those things too. It's like I, we've talked about a bunch on the show about all with all the information about the microbiome is yeah. is the poor nutritionist book uh, <laughs> on the shelf before all of this information was coming to light uh, was missing such a big part of the picture. And then the oh, microbiome with 
But yeah. like Bryn said, it still comes down to eat your veggies, yeah. fiber, <laughs> still the right drink your water. That's, that's it, yeah. It's all it's all still in there. It's a, yeah, it, 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 it is it is amazing that it, like as 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 advanced as some of the research is, it, it just goes back to that. And I and I think and then one of the the other thing that I want to add to that is that a lot of these foods were foods that were sort of undervalued, you know, at least by us and and the Western world. So cassava, yeah. beans, these are things that you know indigenous people have have known and valued for centuries, yeah. and 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 we kind of you know poo pooed all of that. Well, no, it turned poo pooed. Sorry, um, but it turns out that yeah, of course that that is uh, a really important um, a part of nutrition, um, and so now we're kind of coming back to that. So avocados, you know, cassava beans, you know, all of these foods, and and kind of you know rediscovering that. Of course, they've been there all along. It's just that you know some of us in the Western world have sort of ignored them. Um, right. But I think it's, you know, that's worth pointing out that, you know, a lot of cultures have known this for for centuries. And it's amazing that, you know, we ha it, it's taking us going down the scientific route to kind of bring us back again to knowledge that has been held yes. indigenously yep. for years. Um, so. But speaking of our, our modern society and, you know, our technology and everything, with weight, waste treatment plants, I mean, we can track viruses. We know COVID, SARS-CoV-2, is being tracked in our wastewater at this point in time. Um, uh, what did you learn from waste treatment plants about how how we're doing epidemiology these days to just, you know, the good that poo can do for our society yeah. to help us know what's going on? It's, it's such a fascinating story, and I think what... Uh, may surprise a lot of people is that it really has a long history. Um, <clears throat> we were looking for polio, not we, did, but people and uh, researchers, uh, it, 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 as far back as the 30s. And um, I, I think uh, the date was 39, where there was a polio outbreak was the first time that they, uh, the researchers were able to definitively uh, find evidence of polio in the sewers. I think it was uh, Detroit was one of the cities, uh, I want to say uh, city in South Carolina. And then uh, researchers in Sweden confirmed that uh, there was another polio outbreak in Stockholm. Uh, so that was actually a really important aspect of monitoring for decades. And we kind of forgot about that. Um, although there were a lot of these kind of surveillance systems that were sort of trundling along in the background, you know, sort of unnoticed by most people. But, you know, Israel has had one for decades. Um, and then it kind of got uh, rediscovered during COVID. You know, other people were looking at it for drugs. Uh, so for opioids, for example. Um, and then people thought, oh, well, wait a minute. Uh, you know, the COVID virus, you know, has an envelope. And, uh, you know, some of the early research suggested that, you know, a pretty substantial fraction of people were shedding it and their feces. And mm -hmm. so it was making its way to the sewer. And, and it turns out that you can uh, find a very, very small amount of it with their, the sensitive uh, PCR test that we have now. And so that kind of took off um, when done well that can give uh, communities about a week head start wow. because by the time that uh, a clinical case is diagnosed, because you have to, you have to go through the testing, you have to get the test results back, right? Uh, there's a lag there. And so if you can find it in a community's wastewater, you know, it's in the community. And so you can then take steps to prepare for that. You know, now the question then is, OK, well, what are you prepared to do? Right. That's a public health question. Uh, but there were several examples um, that I talk about in the book. Uh, University of Arizona uh, was really effective, as were some other colleges and universities as well. But basically uh, being able to isolate it to specific dorms on campus, then they were able to test everyone in the dorm where this where it lit up and find asymptomatic cases. And so by doing it that way, they figured that they were able to avert dozens of outbreaks. Um, and that was so effective then that that same kind of methodology was used uh, in Yuma, Arizona. So there's a facility, it's called Date, Date Pack. It's a date packing facility. Um, and they used it there and found a silent outbreak among some of their workers. 
um, sent them home with pay. They had no symptoms and were able to uh, avert outbreaks that way as well. Um, the other, I think, adv advantage of doing something like that is that if you're communicating to people, this is what we're doing, this is why this is you know, intended to protect you, you can use this actually as a way to kind of earn the trust you know, of people. So that then when it comes to, okay, what's the public health measure that we're going to do to follow up on that, they may be more likely to trust you. So for example, on the, the date pack uh, uh, facility, when it came time for vaccinations, almost every single person said yes immediately. Um, because they had been very transparent of like, here's what we're doing, here's why. And they saw that it worked, you know, because I think there was skepticism before that they did sure. the testing, like, okay, what, what's this about? And then they were like, oh, crap, you know, this is real. Yeah. Um, and, and then they were able to see that the measures that were taken actually helped avert. Um, outbreaks. So it's it's really effective. Um, it's also being used for monkeypox. Um, it, it can be used for a number of other viruses. Um, it's being used for um, antibiotic resistance. Uh, researchers are actually looking at planes that will take off in one city and land in another because if you look at the bathroom, um, that's basically, you know, being used by people on the plane, right? And it's cleaned after every flight. So of course, there are some privacy issues there as well that would need to be ironed out. But you can literally track the movement of norovirus, of, of uh, antibiotic resistance, of other uh, uh, diseases, and say, we know where the plane started, and we know where it, where it ended up. So, so yeah, it's 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 incredibly effective. Um, I think we, it's just we know, and we know it's all Greg's fault now. <laughs> yeah, we narrowed it down to one guy, apparently. No, no, yeah, they, they, they narrowed they, it down they, to everybody on the plane, and they, then they, they have they, to take it they, the Exactly, exactly. It's that's that, Greg. No, I, I mean, I mean, there, there are there are privacy concerns, right? Because then it, it, it's the question is who deserves to know what you're carrying around inside of you, right? Mm -hmm. And and you know. And, and leaving it on a plane. And so there, there is a balance there. Um, um, and certainly, uh, there's a lot of uh, upside for uh, public health. Uh, yeah. but, but I think there, yeah, I, again, I think there probably needs to be a conversation of like, okay, are there limits to, you know, to, to privacy? Oh, um, it's because it's kind of interesting, that you, you know, that we were, we were fine with using it uh, when we were trying to uh, find out if Greg was using drugs. Or somebody in that neighborhood was by looking at the waste quantum. Right. Uh, but then when it's for public health, we're like, oh, hey, it's everybody's right to have a pathogen go undetected in society. Like, I mean, <laughs> it, like, somebody's medical extreme, issues but, are, yeah. but I think when you're talking about public health, uh, you're talking about something that, I don't know. I, I get the privacy issues, especially when because people want to get away with crime and they should be able to with the you know, Fourth Amendment right to privacy. You should be able to get away with yeah. some personal crime. That's just you should be. That should be allowed. That's part of privacy rights. That just is. That's the privacy <laughs> right. But, but when it comes to health, public health and infecting people, oh, yeah, it's yeah. tougher to make that argument for me. You, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I, I, th I think, yeah. To your point, I mean, I think it, 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 it depends on how, how serious is the public health threat, right? right. And yes, absolutely. I mean, if, if there is a, a, a serious threat, you know, above a particular threshold, then yes, you, you have to weigh the public good against the right to privacy. Absolutely. You investigated so many things, and like the sing singularly worded titles on the bookshelf behind you. You also have a nice single word <laughs> flush. And each of your chapters is has single words for the chapter titles, very thematic. But you spent a lot of time breaking everything down into some wonderful different categories. But at the beginning of our conversation here, you did really make a point of focusing on the good mm -hmm. that our poop, knowing more about what we're releasing into the wild, mm -hmm. um, you know, what good that can do for us as humans. So um, I don't know if that's your message, but if you did have one thing that you want people to gather from this, from reading your book, what do you hope that it is? 
I think the, the overriding message is that uh, learning more about the natural product that we make can help us live more in balance with our own bodies and the rest of nature. You know, we've kind of divorced ourselves from the rest of nature and forgotten that this is how nature works. You know, animals poop, that those nutrients are reused. You know, we have these nutrient cycles, phosphorus, nitrogen, water, the water cycle, and they're reused again and again and again. And we were kind of the odd ones out by saying, oh, no, we have to burn it. We have to bury it. We have to be rid of it. And we're really harming ourselves in the process. And I don't want to minimize the the the, the danger. I mean, obviously, uh, poop mishandled uh, can be uh, incredibly dangerous. And, and in fact, you know, a lot of sanitation crises around the world are, are because the poop is going where it shouldn't go. And right. it's it's an it's it's an incredible problem. And it's astonishing to me just the level of it. And we haven't yet gotten to the point where uh, you know sanitation is is a human right for everyone you know and it should it should be and and i think you know by teaching people that if used in the right way we can not only solve some of these problems like uh, sanitation problems environmental harm we can flip that on its head and use it for environmental remediation we can we can bring value back to some of these communities. And so uh, con container-based sanitation for, uh, is an example uh, where you're basically safely removing the waste and then you're transforming it into something, whether that's fertilizer, whether that's biogas for electricity, uh, you're then basically bringing value back to those same communities. And I think that's just such a wonderful kind of circular economy uh, message. So that's, that's what I hope people take away from it. Poop. It's part of the circle of life. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It definitely is. Um, so your book, how can people find it and connect with you about it? Ah, uh, well, it is uh, available on um, in most uh, bookstores. Um, but if people have questions for me, I would be more than happy to, uh, people can find me on Twitter. I'm uh, Seattle Bryn. Feel free to, to, uh, to ding me uh, on, on Twitter and DM me. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been quite an adventure. And uh, I, you know, obviously can talk about this for a long time. <laughs> but, I love uh, but it. I, we, yeah. can go, we can go deep. Go deep yes. in the Go deep in the poo. <laughs> absolutely, ab absolutely, and there there will be puns uh, in the book, but but hopefully it's a way for uh, for people to have uh, uh, to get more comfortable with it, you know, so that we can have more serious conversa conversations, and we really need to. Absolutely, I've enjoyed reading it very much. Not only because you do uh, reference me in one of the early parts of the book, I not do. only because of that. Yeah. <laughs> I do. It's, but, and it's, for quite, a, it's quite memorable. So, and it's yeah. a, for a punny reason too. Uh, but, <laughs> but the the book itself, I've really enjoyed reading it. I think that you touch on so many uh, wonderful topics, and I I really do hope that people don't let their disgust and their distaste for the topic lead them away from this book, and that they actually do, you know, check it out and. Enjoy the puns and your humor. I mean, you had to have a sense of humor <laughs> in addressing this topic, and you and you did, yes. and you you handled all the topics from humorous to serious in a, a very great manner. So, yeah, thank, thanks thank for you. writing a good book. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for for having me on. It's it's been great. Yeah, it's been a fun talk. We do have some more science stories to discuss. This is This Week in Science, and if you are enjoying the show, I implore you, well, I'm asking you very gently to head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. Our Patreon community is how we support the show, and your support is greatly appreciated. $10 and more a month, and we will thank you by name at the end of the show. I look forward to reading your name. Can't do this without you. Thank you for your support. All right, this is This Week in Science. And we're going to come back, but we don't have the animal corner. But, oh, Justin. Oh, we do. Did you, did you bring an animal story? 
It's Blair's Animal Corner with Justin. Hey, hey everybody. Blair. Hi. Uh, so, so this week in uh, Justin's Blair's Animal Corner, lots of creatures use camouflage to avoid getting eaten by predators. Some use a strategy of blending in or background matching as a way to avoid being seen. Uh, this is what chameleons, maybe an arctic fox, are doing. The Vietnamese mossy frogs that kind of have skin that looks a little bit like, like mossy itself and even have green eyes kind of blend in well. Many insects match their environment that they're doing this. Basically the idea behind military camouflage as well. Blending in to the environment. Others attempt a more complicated form of mimicry. Masquerading is something they are not. An insect that looks like a leaf or a stick. And maybe I put into that category a hoverfly. Mm. Uh, that's a fly that looks like a wasp. It's got the, the yellow and black bands on it. It looks just like a wasp. You would not guess that it was a fly, but it's actually just a fly. Totally not a wasp. Which strategy, though, is the most effective? The, the backgrounding or the mimicking? Researchers looked at 84 previous studies. Each had run experiments to rate how well a given camouflage strategy worked, how long it took for a predator to find a camouflage prey in a controlled environment, and uh, whether or not they were at what percentage rate they got attacked. They boiled this down to a predator uh, search time and a predator attack rate of the camouflaged prey. Camouflage was found to be generally an effective survival strategy as it took 62% longer for predators to find them than uncamouflaged prey, and they were attacked 27% less often. So you, you hid better uh, and, and you were less often attacked if you had some form of camouflage. Masquerading camouflage, that's the one like if you're the insect that looks like a, a stick. Uh, you, you, mimicked you look something like a in the leaf. environment. Right, you look like something mm-hmm. else. Yeah. Was the most effective as it increased predator search times by almost 300%. So if you can't be seen, you also can't be eaten. So they were also attacked and eaten much, much less often. Research suggests that the reason more creatures do, uh, do not use masquerading as camouflage strategy, first of all, that's got to be a Difficult thing for nature to arrange for you to look like a leaf or a stick or have a fly that looks just like a wasp. That's got to just be hard, I guess, to get there. But you also have to be roughly the same size as the thing you're trying to match. So uh, a zebra masquerading as a wasp doesn't <laughs> work. Would not be effective. <laughs> no. For Wrong uh, side. Ha- Having eye spots, you know how you, sometimes you got animals and they have like a thing that looks like an eye, but that's not really where their eye is. Mm-hmm. Didn't affect anything at all. Oh no! Yeah, there's so, so many that, eye spots in nature. There's I so many have... eye spot creatures, uh, which yeah. might suggest it isn't actually a camouflage component after all, <laughs> or uh, it simply works best on a specific predator that somehow eluded the study. So these are also studies that uh, looked at several different types of prey uh, right. and generalized the results together, but it also had several different kinds of predators that got generalized together in this. So uh, so keep that in mind. But uh, overall, their, the having of eye spots, a sort of eye camouflage, no effect. Wasn't Didn't make things worse. Didn't improve either the, the search times or the attack rates. They also point out that most of the studies they used were conducted in the northern hemisphere, uh, which, I mean, right there, that leaves out the rainforest of South America, which must be absolutely rich in these uh, strategies. So definitely, as we often say at the end of every story, more research is needed. Speaking of more research, another animal story. Blair brought a story last year related to cockatoos opening up garbage cans in Australia and people being upset because the cockatoos were spreading garbage all around. But the garbage is a great source of food resources for these cockatoos. So it's been very important for the cockatoos to learn how to get into the garbage bins. Well, 
in the latest update to this saga of cockatoos versus garbage cans, it's turned into cockatoos versus humans. And the latest study that has been published in Current Biology um, is really looking into the interaction between the humans and the cockatoos and looking at what has happened in this evolution. Human residents are trying to keep cockatoos out. And so while they're keeping them out of the bins, they have started putting bricks and stones on the bin lids, strapping water bottles to the top, rigging ropes to prevent the lid from flipping, using sticks to block the hinges. And then they switch tactics once the cockatoos figure it out. But then, so the humans are also learning from their neighbors as to what their neighbors are doing. So the tactics that neighboring humans are using. So there's human spread learning of information and knowledge that's happening on a house by house, neighborhood by neighborhood kind of basis. The cockatoos as well are learning new tactics and cockatoos are learning from each other and spreading successful tactics around. And so this is definitely, um, it's, it's predator prey, but it's a competition that's going on. It's, it's not predator prey, but it's, it's a competition of motivation. Well, but Who is more motivated, the cockatoos or the or the humans? <laughs> it, it might turn into that. The cockatoos might just get fed up with all the things they're having to jump through to get to the trash, and they just might start taking people's groceries when they get home. Just, you know, hey, you know, <laughs> we were totally happy going through the stuff you didn't want, but if you're forcing our hand, we'll just take the stuff that you just buy right out of here. The cockatoos are going to escalate. Yeah, and and that's and that's exactly what this researcher is looking into. Um, you know, but it's not just the cockatoos who are escalating. So, what will happen next with the humans? And this is just part of the interesting interactions that occur between animals and humans as we, you know, as we spread out more and more, and uh, you know, as humans are putting ourselves into historic. Uh, ecosystems that have been, uh, you know, the homes of the homes of the cockatoos, right? Here where I am, I see co co uh, coyotes up on the hill because we're putting our homes where coyotes live. We are moving into their habitats and ecosystems. So, but these interactions are very interesting. Justin, do you have more stories? I got one more story for tonight. Uh, adaptation to environment, something required for all living things. We even talked about it a little bit uh, on the show today. We humans often pride ourselves on our ability to live across many varied environments across the planet, sometimes interacting with coyotes and cockatoos. Mm -hmm. uh, early on, we found we would we'd seek out and find caves that we could just move into. Later, we learned how to make our own caves and put them anywhere on the world. Uh, pretty much wherever you go on land, you find humans. Fungi exist everywhere humans do, and many, many places we don't, like oceans. Uh, of course, inside of most animals, they are living there as well. Adapting to environment is a strategy that fungi understand better than most any other life form on Earth. Yeah. One interesting example of fungal superiority in this regard is Cryptococcus neoformans. Fungus uh, responsible for cryptococcosis, uh, which can infect human lungs as a pneumonia and can make it to the brain as a meningitis, a swelling mm. of the brain. Mm. So cryptococcus neoformans starts out living in the environment. It'll be in rotting wood. It's found often in pigeon poop or in the soil, pretty much anywhere in the world where you have rotting wood, soil, and pigeons. Right? <laughs> Which is everywhere. That's right. That's already an achievement. Everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. But then it can enter the human's body. When it enters human lungs, for instance, the cells can grow to 10 times their normal size. You may think that's a strategy or a way for it to become more difficult, to make it more difficult for the immune system to, to attack and destroy them. They can also uh, remain in their smaller sizes, travel throughout the blood system, reaching other organs. And according to the scientists at University of Utah Health, in a recent report, they can shrink to a much smaller than usual size, 
to get past the blood-brain barrier and infect the brain, causing meningitis. Uh, this is sort of interesting because there is already a stochastic size difference within this fungus, where some, and even in the lungs, would get very big, and some would be medium, and some would be small. And when they looked at uh, somebody studying lungs and used to this stochastic varied uh, size differentials, looked at slides of the fungi in a brain of a patient with meningitis, they found them all to be uniform and of this much smaller size. So they infected mice with various sizes of Cryptococcus neoformans. They found that indeed the smallest cells preferentially affect, infected the brain. Although you also say that we were screened in a sense too. It's that you had to be small to get there. This, these cells were not only diminutive, though. They weren't just sm like immature or small. Compared with the larger cells, they had unique features on their surface that were similarly important for accessing the brain. They also turned on different sets of genes. So this okay. is a stochastic uh, adaptation where you try different strategies at the same time. To sort of uh, what do you call it, shotgun effect your environment. Yeah. See what see what size difference. See if we turn these genes on over here, and some of us some of us keep those genes off and turn on different ones. That gives you a broader uh, reach uh, for biome niche researchers. Also found that phosphate seems to play a central role in the forming of these microversion cells. The microcells had an exp enhanced expression of phosphate acquisition genes. So these and mutants that were unable to uh, acquire phosphate were not able to have the same morphotypes as the really, really small ones. So that becomes interesting because of one of the places that we're used to finding uh, this. Well, for one, when there's an injury around tissue, tissues release phosphates. So this can be a thing that on site of an injury could accelerate infection of, of a mammal. Yep. But also, we find this in pigeon droppings, which is high in phosphate. Yeah. So that yeah. also might be a clue to how it got small uh, enough to be easily transmittable. Uh, into into humans in the first place. So uh, the size variation represents inducible morphotypes that change host interactions to facilitate the microbe spread and links to the, the that study where it's published are on our website. That's fascinating. So yeah, it's specifically adapted to make infection easier. Get it gets in the lungs. It's yeah. small enough to be transported, inhaled, uh, get into the bloodstream through the blood-brain barrier, and then it can seed the infection. So that then, from that particular morphotype, it can grow into its more usual fungal state. But, it can grow into a larger yeah. cell in the lungs, where it, yeah. it makes it easier to survive, and it can and, also get smaller. So yeah, it can go other places. Like, yeah. Could go all over. Woo! That's so wild. I mean, people don't do that. That's a that's a strategy thing beyond people. Hey, okay, well, let's make yeah. one of us two feet tall and another one of us thirty feet tall, and we'll be able to chase right. after gophers in the in the gopher hole and pick yeah. uh, those coconuts <laughs> right off the tree or whatever we're doing. We don't have options uh, like that. Yeah. But in the, in this particular case, it's, you know, it's interesting to understand how these morphotypes work because the future is fungal. And when we're looking at health, public health issues of the future, funguses are at the top of the list, especially with a lot of uh, the climate change uh, that we're seeing. There have been a lot of stories recently from the Central Valley, California of uh, Coccosporidium, I believe, which uh, causes valley fever. And there have been a lot of stories of more valley fever cases kind of popping up than usual. Um, and it's a it's a fungus. And uh, we, we don't know enough about fungi. We need to learn about the infectious 
funguses that uh, are going to be affecting us. And uh, this is huge research that can help us potentially discover the different pathways. Are there specific targets we can look for? How can, you know, can we look for uh, pH uh, or not pH phosphate, um, some kind of metabolism, uh, you know, what proteins are involved? Can we target, um, I don't know, like like you worked on in, in your PhD work, uh, Bryn, with E. coli, you right. know, maybe a sugar channel, but not a sugar channel or... or uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean, nature Nature is just fascinating. And I mean, and you're right, there's there's, there's so much that we have let to, yet, yet to learn about some of these just ingenious adaptations, um, you know, of, of these pathogens. And, and you're right, I mean, uh, you know, not to take this back to poop uh, specifically, but... But, but you there's can. A, but, but I can't. Um, but but the, I mean, there's a long list of, of pathogens and sort of like the wish list for environmental surveillance. Um, yeah. And we're just not doing it, you know, and and wastewater epidemiology is one form of it. It's certainly not the only one, uh, but but it can be incredibly important. Um you know, and, and, and I think people are realizing that we need to have the infrastructure to do way more, you know, whether it's whether it's uh, fungi, whether it's viruses, whether it's uh, bacteria. Um, yeah, we're we're we have we have a long way to go. <laughs> Such a long way. <laughs> but we are close to uh, replacing psychedelics with virtual reality. What? Prove it. <laughs> well, I can't do that right now, and uh, prove it is a really hard statement in science. I'll know it when I see it do. firsthand. <laughs> right. I need a side by side comparison now, darn it. Now, right now. Oh, no, I got uh, a busy day ahead, but anyway. <laughs> publishing in Scientific Reports this week, researchers are uh, talking about their work in a VR platform, uh, which they have created called Isness and Isness D, Isness Distributed. So Isness in uh, this lab um, that works on using virtual reality for, uh, for potential therapies, it's the head of the Inta Intangible Realities Laboratory, um, which is IRL, which, haha, which I find kind of funny. Anyway, this project is has been looking at whether or not participants can have a, a transcendent state in which they leave their or lose their sense of self, release the sense of ego, and are able to perceive a sense of oneness with others. And in this uh this platform of VR, you are represented as a, uh, a ball of light within a human type form. It's all very fuzzy and uh, not as defined as our physical forms. And they started with isness, which is co-localized togetherness. And uh, people will uh, wear VR headsets and enter the VR situation together in the same room. So holding hands, but uh, in the VR space. So they're connected, but also in a physical location and also within this virtual location. The balls of light then move around and get rid of within the VR space, the sense of your physical body. And so the idea is that with the representation within the VR space, participants lose a sense of really where their bodies stop and someone else's body begins. And participants in the co-localized experiments said that very that they did have these experiment these experiences and they actually had these feelings of connected connectedness and oneness with others so then the researchers said can we do this remotely can we make it distributed and so um, that's when they moved on to the isness d and were able to bring together people from all around the world in a a crowdsourced experiment, experiment where they had users all over the world uh, use the platform, and um, they and they they say that they 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 analyze the results 
using four key scales applied in previous studies with psychedelics to assess the subjective phenomenon phenomenology of isness D. In fact, and to the best of our knowledge, this work represents the first attempt to analyze a virtual reality experience, experience using these measurement scales. Um, and the complexities that they found that isness D scores on all four scales were statistically indistinguishable from those of recently published psychedelic drug studies. Oh. Yeah. So can virtual reality taking yourself, it's, it, maybe it's kind of like an isolation tank experience where you isolate yourself. Um, I, I don't know. I, I haven't tried this. I am skeptical, but at the same time, I am curious. Can we use these virtual reality technologies to simulate some aspects, not all the aspects, but some aspects of uh, psychedelics that have led to beneficial psychological experiences in people's lives that have uh, treated depression, anxiety, and a host of other issues related also to the fear of dying. So there's a lot. There's a On lot. The, in it. Uh, maybe. I don't think so. <laughs> I, I think, I, you know, I, to me, this is a. First of all, unless the drugs have really changed since, since I was a since you were person. a kid, yeah, uh, back in the '60s, I, you know, like there's brain chemistry, uh, temporary brain chemistry. Some of it maybe a little more permanent. Uh, changes that take place, uh, perception filters. I mean, you, you read. Something like uh, Aldous Huxley's Doors of Perception, I think it is, where he, does, he writes about being on mescaline, for an example. The things he's talking about are visually and time perception uh, differences that I don't think you're getting from like, oh, whose body, is, who's touching who, like whatever, in the virtual thing. The, like a lot of these concepts of oneness are not, I don't think, as surface as, as you don't people think I, right. no, I believe i believe there's a lot more like deep amygdala tuning <laughs> that's taking place chemically that that may not be visual perception oriented that may be some byproduct uh, affect of it but it doesn't seem to me like but so here's the question like, is is it the uh, the I mean, there's always the, the brain and behavior feedback loop, right? Your body affects your brain, your brain affects your body, your entire nervous system, proprioception, and all the things creates your sense of self and your sense of space and what, what space you exist within in the universe. And so that physicality of it, does changing that physicality necessarily have to be chemical to have permanent um, or chemically started to have permanent downstream neural changes. So this kind of VR experience, by just experiencing whatever the situation is that they've put together, someone getting through this kind of this groundbreaking experience of feeling connected to others, does that itself, that experience, is that what rewires your brain? Is that what starts the process? My guess is that's all that, that all everything they're playing with is the artifacts related to. So it's like it's the difference of getting clean by taking a nice hour long hot bath and it's really soaking in the suds. And then and it's like, hey, we've got something just like that. And then somebody takes a sprayer and spritzes you in the face a bunch of times. You're like, OK, I'm wet, but I am not clean <laughs> at all. Like that didn't do. I get how you connected the two. Hey, there's wetness involved, but it doesn't right. mean. I don't know. I'm. Do I seem skeptical? You do. I... you do. You do. You <laughs> do. Was there a placebo control? I mean, did, did did they have people that were basically holding hands in a darkened room with the headsets on, but it just it was I don't know playing a Disney movie instead or something? <laughs> um, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be yeah. curious to know because because presumably like the power of suggestion there right might have uh, a huge have, impact right have yeah. an impact. Yeah, so, um, yeah, as far as I know, there's not a placebo group that everyone was experimenting within the platform. So that is a big, um, that's a big oh, hole in this study. Oh, good, good, uh, good, uh, 
good <laughs> format, good uh, protocols to be taking their virtual, albeit, trip in a group where they can watch out for one another. That's always advisable there when doing a virtual thing. <laughs> it's always good to to have that sense of community and have someone watching over yeah. you. But uh, it's it's interesting. It's very interesting. Thank you for bringing up the the how the study is designed, and I will look into that um, more specifically to be able to answer that question because it's a good question. Is it really science if you don't have a control group, <laughs> or is it just people playing in VR? It's just people playing in VR. I think we've come to the end of the show. What do you think? Oh, I think that is that it. I Are we, we done are. playing oh. in our virtual world so, here? So soon? No. So soon. <clears throat> Only a little more than our normal tight 90. But yes. Ah, we've done it, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode. I do appreciate you being here. And Bryn, thank you so much for yeah. joining us once again, for yeah. talking about your book. And for everyone out there, remember, you can... Find Bryn's book, Flush, The Remarkable Science of an Unlikely, unlikely Treasure. All places Thank books you. about poop are found. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Drop yeah, we didn't poop. even get we didn't even get the touch into the agricultural aspects and all the other oh, things. I, I know, there's too much. There's a lot more in there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, but no, thank you. you. It's, it's it's been it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great having you on the show. And I just do want to say thank you to a few people who help out the show. Our shout outs, Fada, thank you so much for doing the social media and our show notes for YouTube. It, that just really is such a wonderful help to us. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. Gord and Aaron Lore, thank you for making sure our chat rooms are nice, happy places for people to hang out. And I also have to thank Rachel for wonderful editing. Thank you for doing that job. And many, many thanks to our Patreon sponsors, who, of course, as I said before, I must thank by name. Thank you to Teresa Smith, James Schaefer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazard, Ralphie Figueroa, John Ratner, Swami, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody Muss, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vegard, Chef Stad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Gorov, Sharma, Regan, Derek Schmidt, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberan, Daryl Marks, Jack, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredis 104, Sky Luke, Paul Runovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles Jack, Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Matt Bass, Vote Beto for Texas, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Jean Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Herod, Howard Tan, Christopher Drappen, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramos, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Adam Mishkan, Cameron Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve Bell, Bob Bacalder, Marjorie Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link on next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific Time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels, as well as twist.org slash live. And if you want to listen to us as a podcast, you can just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe, too. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. You can contact us directly. Email me, Kirsten, at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at blairbaz at twist.org. Just put twists in the subject line so your email doesn't get spam filtered into a waste treatment plant where there's <laughs> Absolutely no privacy. <laughs> oh no! Uh, you can also uh, ping us on the Twitter, where we are at Twist Science, at Doctor Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes due in the night, please let us know. 
And we'll be back here again next week. And we hope that you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science This week in science this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science.